brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries. In the weeks ahead, you will see these and other programs by various denominations. Dialogue, a public affairs program at the crossroads of religion and life, a series highlighting the cultural and social interaction between the worshiping and religious communities in and around the capital city. Austin Faith Dialogue is brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KTVC. Join us now in Austin Faith Dialogue. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, their words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill towards men. These familiar lyrics of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow set the tone for this edition of Boston Faith Dialogue on Christmas art. I'm Richard Thompson, privileged to be your host for this celebration, when there will be a ringing of the holiday carols, dramatizations by youth of Central Presbyterian Church and artistic representations of the season from the Huntington Art Gallery at the University of Texas. The Youth Handbell will now open our program with sounds of the Christmas spirit. So it is with the sounds of the bells resounding in our hearts that we're prepared to hear the voice dramatizing the way in which this season came to be celebrated. To lead us back toward the beginning is narrator Spring Cobb. It was long after the events in Bethlehem transpired that the remembrances commemorating them commenced. It was three and a half centuries after the earthly life of Jesus when Liberius was Bishop of Rome. One December day, he surprised the citizens of that city and members of the church by an announcement which accounts for the origin of the Christmas festival. Acolyte, Acolyte. Yes, Bishop Liberius? Is my flock gathered? I have a special announcement to make. They are here, Bishop of Rome. What is the news? You will soon see. I have joyous news. My dear people, in this year of 354, I announce a new holiday to honor our Lord's birth. Did you say holiday, Bishop? Why, we're already celebrating a holiday, the Saturnalia. We always celebrate the return of the sun, beginning December 17th. But not anymore. My people, that's a pagan celebration for a false god. It's just an excuse for wild and immoral behavior. But what about the birthday of the sun? Every year, the sun moves south until we are afraid that it will drop off the end of the earth. Is it any wonder we celebrate when it returns? Look, the sun is moving higher. Yes, it's been born again. The sun is coming back. My people, God has made the sun to always come back. We can thank him for that. But what we Christians ought to celebrate is the birth of God's son, who gives us new life in the spirit. You're right, Bishop. That's what's most important. But what shall we call this new holiday? We shall call it Christmas, Christ's Mass. 
From now on, all generations of Christians will celebrate with communion on the date of his birth, December 25th. So it is for generations that this custom originating as Christmas has been observed at this time of year. But it took more than what was merely customary to inspire the artistic imagination of creative geniuses who drew representations of the events preceding and including the nativity itself. To guide us in this very special sharing of prints and drawings from the Huntington Gallery, the University of Texas, is Worth Bracken. Worth, we welcome you to our program today. Thank you, Richard. And I would look forward to having you share with us something of the a series of prints that you have uh, brought from UT and uh, perhaps can just give us a little bit of an indication of how many different periods are we going to be viewing here. Well, I've tried to choose uh, prints from a number of different periods. We've got um, prints from Renaissance period, Mannerist, Baroque, uh, prints from woodcut, prints from etching, prints with intaglio. We're um, also going to be looking at a combination of the period from School of Paris around 1500, which will be dealing with a um, combination of book printing and manuscript illumination, which I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there's also one drawing, which is very fine, which will be included in which, what we'll see. Anything from more recent times that will be... There are a couple at. from the 20th century, two Mexican artists, which uh, uh, I think illustrate very nicely how these have still a contemporary meaning for us, the themes of the season. All right. Well, why don't we begin by looking at uh, the first of these uh, prints and giving us a little bit of background on that. This is The Virgin Seated at the Foot of a Tree by Albrecht Durer. It's um, a lovely print which shows the Virgin and the Child in a very humanistic, natural pose together, concentrating on their aspect, more on the human aspect, really, of the, of the couple as opposed to their um, supernatural or majestical type of aspect, which we might see occurring a bit later. The, uh, the way in which they're seated at the foot of the tree with the fence back behind them is uh, a fairly uh, normal sort of pose for this sort of thing for the period. And uh, in fact, Durer did other prints which are similar to this. Mm -hmm. I have the sense that Durer, as uh, a contemporary of Martin Luther and like Luther in terms of being very down to earth, I mean, this could be a peasant woman and child. There's nothing royal about it. There's nothing particularly supernatural about it, as you said. It's very no, earthy. Yeah, it's very earthy. It deals very much with, um, it relates very immediately to people as human beings and uh, to how we care for other people and to the religious life for what it means to us as human beings. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's clearly a very beautiful work of art. He was concerned all of his life with the, the manifestation of religious spirituality through, through beauty in mm. art. Not art uh, for its own sake, but art as it conveyed that spiritual truth. Um, in, in general, I think that's fair to say. It's, he did do other work, of course, aside mm -hmm. from, from religious work. But okay. Well, let's see what, uh, what we have coming next in terms of time and, and form. Uh, this is another Madonna and Child image, as, as will be the next two, um, by Heinrich Aldegraver. This one I thought was interesting. It's, he was really one of the little German masters, a sort of school of Durer, really, just, just maybe a generation just after him. It uh, shows the Virgin and Child with, uh, with combining motifs of a halo and a crown so that they become much more majestic. This print and execution is much more hesitant than the, than the Durer is and uh, shows maybe some slight Italian influences in modeling of the figure. But um, I really wanted to include this to show the sort of the more of a majestical representation mm -hmm. of the Virgin. Mm -hmm. She's looking straight at the, at the viewer and uh, the less naturalistic and more much stylized. less naturalistic. Yes. She's uh -huh. much more formal in her in her carriage. Let's take a look at the next one just to see as a comparison. Uh, what what is style? And then what here period? we have a Hieronymus Virix. Uh, this is a Flemish Madonna and Child. Um, this is is a century later, and it shows uh, a much more sort of naturalistic, almost mannerist sort of approach to the to the uh, articulation of the figure 
on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's, it's combining that with the, the majestic Mary again. She's mm -hmm. looking at the Christ child. She's, she's clearly a mother in that sense but, uh, and is concerned with him. But she's also still fairly rigid in her in the way she's holding her neck, and she's got a uh, at this point a halo or a nimbus of stars uh, surrounded then with her head and the Christ head surrounded mm -hmm. by a, an aureolus of light. Uh, Again, a, a, a contrast to the Durer that we started out with in terms of its informality. Yes, yes, I think so. And as well, the Durer was set in a naturalistic setting, if you remember, whereas this is uh, just just composed with the Madonna and Child. Okay, I think we have another in the Madonna and Child sequence. Yeah, this is one which includes an image of Saint Anne. This is um, by Federico Cantu, who's a contemporary Mexican artist. Um, Cantu works, started working with religious images around the 19, late 1940s uh, and switched really from painting into printmaking. He uh, um, brings an intensely spiritual approach to the art and in a Catholic sense the uh, the inclusion of Saint Anne in this in this instance reinforces the, the Catholic aspect of that because she's not actually mentioned by name in the Bible itself mm -hmm. she's uh, occurs in the second century but this is a contemporary uh, expression is again picking up more of the naturalistic this, this goes back and echoes the Durer in a lot of respects I think it's it's not in a natural setting, but it's got the plants behind it so that you, you really do relate it to something in the natural world. Mm -hmm. And it shows them clearly as people. Although Mary is very rigid and very, very formal in her pose, uh, Saint Anne is very much the grandmother and the child is very much the child. Okay. Now I believe the next series uh, brings us into um, uh, events surrounding the nativity. Yeah, this is... Um, uh, of course, The Angel Appearing to the Shepherds by Rembrandt. It's a very well-known etching from one of his earlier periods. Um, it uh, is pretty much self-descriptive. The shepherds are fleeing from the, the glory of the angel who is almost being propelled with all the uh, little pooty out of, out of almost a hole in the sky, which is, you know, you can imagine the glory uh, behind the, that, that mm -hmm. scene. Rembrandt is... Um perhaps uh, as famous uh, artists as you have represented in, in your collection. I, uh, I think that uh, the one thing that uh, occurs to me is that he usually has a very human touch as well. Yeah, in, in a lot of his work he places people very much into a uh, natural setting. He gives them costume of the time and this sort of thing. So he makes it, brings it down very much to the, uh, the Dutch period that he's working in. Um, I understand that uh, Rembrandt was among the first to use Jews as models of biblical characters, Wait. that he had the uh, virtually all of the, in the Rembrandt Bibles that you find, virtually all the mm -hmm. main scenes uh, that he, uh, he uh, drew or painted at one point in his life, and among biblical painters is outstanding in that regard. Yeah, yeah, he really brought uh, a level of realism to it, which we nowadays as moderns uh, relate to very easily. I think that's that's one reason for his popularity and for his renown. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we move from that to, a, I think, another period and a, uh, another style. Yeah, this is a, uh, the, the uh, combination of woodblock book printing and illumination of manuscript, which I was talking about. This was in a sort of transition period between the two, and they were working the two out. There's a woodblock print image of the frame underneath the hand painting. There's uh, it's a shame it's in black and white for this, but there's a lot of gold and rich blues and reds in the, in the, in the uh, production of it at School of Paris from around 1500. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple, just nativity scene. There, there's no adoration involved by outside people, such as the Magi or the Shepherds. Um, there are some onlookers, but they're really... It's, it's again, it's set within, a, within a, a realistic urban environment in the sense that there are onlookers who are just kind of curious. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, as we pick up this scene, this is a closer up view. Well, no, this is the Spronger drawing. Uh, it's a drawing of the Holy Family. Um, it was actually a, what we call a cartoon for an etching, and it's interesting if you get close enough, you can see along the lines where the pinpricks have been made to trace it, the image into the etching plate. It's um, a beautiful print, uh, I mean a beautiful drawing, excuse me showing a sort of full 
full-blown mannerism at its, at its highest point. He was one of the greatest of the uh, mannerist artists of the Low Countries. Uh, it invites you into a sort of monumental world of the Renaissance, but, but in almost an unreal, almost overly monumental, sort of over-emphasizing the, the beauty of the line and of the, uh, the composition. I think in this last of the series that uh, show the events surrounding the Nativity, uh, we have uh, one that is, again, yeah. from what period? Oh, well, I put this one a bit late. I, I took this one out of narrative order just to include it in with the f Holy Family scenes. To Rest on the Flight into Egypt by Simone Cantorini, as you could see, this is uh, more of a Baroque style of treatment. The line has broken up, uh, treats the form very, very fully. There's a very sort of three-dimensionality to it on the one hand. On the other hand, there's a nice surface texture of a kind of shimmering, watery, rippling quality almost to it. And I like that interplay between the, the, the solidness of the form and the way it invites you into mm -hmm. a very naturalistic setting. But it invites you into, I don't know, another sort of, it's a different world though, because it is this kind of shimmering reflection of, of the real world. Well, that, uh, that is a graphic series of contrasts and styles and periods, and we'll look forward to the remainder of these. I think that uh, before we proceed, however, to uh, the concluding um, sketches and etchings that we see, we'll have another depiction by, uh, in a dramatized form, again by the young people from Central Presbyterian Church. Uh, this, however, being of how we come to another one of our holiday remembrances, well over 700 years ago it began. Yes, it was in the 13th century that Francis of Assisi surprised his contemporaries, not only by forsaking the status to which he had been born, as a son of a well-to-do Italian merchant, but by giving himself to the service of the poor. Particularly did he surprise villagers one day with the way he devised to show forth the lowliness of the Most High. Francis, what are you up to now? Why have you asked us to bring all our animals? Yes, why have I brought my donkey and my chickens? And why have we bought our cow and a stable box we used to feed her with? What are you doing? Are you all right? I have never been better. I have had a wonderful idea. My friends, Christmas is a time of wonder. Have you ever thought it strange that the Son of God was born humbly amongst the animals in a stable? Yes, he could have born, born in a great palace but it was the animals who saw him born. Then let us recreate that scene so that everyone can come and see the loneliness from which the Most High came. Whenever people see this major scene, it will remind them of the most wonderful miracle of all, the birth of the Son of God. Yes, let us worship him tonight in a special way to remember his humble birth. Wait until I tell the others. Everyone will want to come see this. And all those who see it will be like the shepherds on the first Christmas. And all will wonder at this miracle. And among those who have wondered at the way in which the Most High has become lowly for our sake are those artists who have delineated the events following the Nativity. And worth as we learn how the uh, manger scene came to be uh, remembered through the crash scene from mm -hmm. these last few generations, we also have uh, some artistic representations of this and what we're about to see, and perhaps you could share with us uh, yeah, what this will be. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, this is a, a beautiful uh, beautiful print here. It's um, a Durer, actually. It's not on the screen. Um, and it's an adoration of the shepherds of the, ver of the, the Holy Family. It's, um, it's done from a strange angle, but it actually works. The angle would normally attract your attention up someplace into the roof, but because of the way the wall and the cross beams and then the shepherds entering in uh, compositionally works, it draws your attention almost more forcefully back down to the to the uh, uh, the holy family as a result of the fact that you're you know it's, you're really being directed intentionally to that spot. Mm -hmm. um, I really like a lot of things about this. Um, a, it's an intelli a very intelligently laid out composition so that you can see that there is a world again beyond what's just what's going on within the room itself. There are holes in the roof, the walls end so mm -hmm. that you can see beyond them. Uh, but the world is not allowed to intrude on that. This is given 
a very central meaning, and this is a sort of worldview I think that he's bringing to it in the sense that this is what is central to the world, that the world does exist, there is the secular world, but that this is the central element in the composition, the greater composition of So the interaction between the, the, the whole world and, and this uh, one event is juxtaposed in that one I th drawing. I think, as I see it, I think that that's a valid conclusion to take. This is our second Drewer, so let's see how we can contrast that with what is yet to follow. This is uh, an adoration of the shepherds by Giorgio Gizzi. Um, I think it's very interesting to compare the two, um, try to keep in mind the one we just looked at. The direction of the action, although the, the buildings are set off into the opposite direction, the direction of the action is still the same. The shepherds are coming in from the same direction. Um, we're brought up to a view of viewing it just directly, though, without, the, without uh, Durer's incredible, incredibly worked out um, compositional schemes. Uh, this is um, an etching. It's very good quality. Um, Jeezy was a person who was really contributed to a lot as far as the history of art goes to the, the revival of, or to the promulgation of mannerism in, the, uh, in northern Europe. Okay, now as we come to the next one, do we have uh, a style other than, we have much of a different yes, style here. <laughs> quite a different style. That was one thing I was looking for, is trying to juxtapose styles occasionally, wake us up. This is modern, isn't it? This is modern. It's uh, by uh, Shotsit Siatsen who is a modern contemporary Amer uh, uh, Mexican, he uh, relies very deeply on a spiritual, what for him is a spiritual reality of the religious meaning of Christianity, but he also identifies very strongly with the pre-Columbian past of Mexico, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, as is indicated even in his, the use of his name, which is actually not in Spanish, it's the, uh, the language of the Aztecs. I see. Now, as we come to the last one, uh, we have, uh, again, just a, a very striking contrast. Yeah, this one I thought was nice to finish up on. It's an adoration of the Virgin. It includes the Holy Family. It includes all the different elements that we've worked with so far. Uh, it includes a very simple Madonna and Child image placed within the context of the Holy Family, Joseph somewhat further back there, and then with an adoration of different uh, historical personages around it. Within a composition, again, architecturally it allows you to see beyond the immediate room that they're in so that there is something beyond that uh, it's interesting to have Moses up in the top of the, the composition in that lunette where he can uh, this is one of the central themes of medieval and then Renaissance art of, of the New Testament and the birth of Christ the nativity scene echoing a lot of what goes on in the, the Old Testament mm -hmm. or really fulfilling I suppose the, the prophecies and the, the, the laws one of the things that uh, I think uh, is fitting to conclude the artistic uh, review is how the University of Texas is a repository of, of riches of, of, of in this, this print collection. Many people don't know that it's there in our midst here in this community. Oh yeah, we've got at the print collection alone there are hundreds of prints and drawings, original works of art, um, which are exhibited on a, on a regular basis in the mezzanine of the Huntington Art Gallery. Mm -hmm. um, it's open to the public to go in and, and have a look at these shows. They're chosen around certain themes. There's a, a good show at the moment for just being coming acquainted with prints in the sense of a, a print study show. And it, mm -hmm. it's a wide variety of different styles, different periods. Well, you've given us a wide variety of view just today, and we certainly appreciate your being with us. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. And uh, our thanks is also extended to the Huntington Gallery itself for sharing this with us. And we're looking forward now to... Um, one other of the uh, dramatizations which uh, brings memory into play in a very special way. It was not a pretty setting. In fact, just the opposite. During World War II in a concentration camp, when the end of one of those years drew near, the dilemma posed itself to these prisoners as to how to celebrate the season in the midst of grim circumstance. My friends, it is Christmas, 1943. We must celebrate. Let us sing together. How can we celebrate? How can we sing joy to the world when there is no joy in this grim prison, which is our world? How can we sing joy to the world when we have no hymn books to sing it with? How can we sing together when we are not from the same church? Some of us are not from any church. What you say is true. But we all share a common heritage, whether we go to church or not. 
Christ belongs to everyone, even those who do not believe he belongs to them. Christ is with us, even now in this concentration camp. You're right, friend. Let us sing together. It will lift our spirits. If we cannot remember the words to the carols, perhaps we could teach each other to remember them. I remember, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. But what comes after that? Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. In heaven and heaven and nature sing. My friends, I believe if we help each other, this can be the most joyous Christmas we've ever had, even though we're in prison. And certainly the manner in which these persons were able to celebrate nearly 50 years ago helps us do so more today. And these young people who have gathered here today by their artistic expression have deepened our appreciation of the origin and never ceasing inspiration of the season. As the Youth Bell Choir of Central Presbyterian Church concludes our program, in behalf of Austin Metropolitan Ministries, I'm Richard Thompson, wishing you a joyful holiday. And may it uh, be a work of art for you.